there's something beautiful about nature's ability to rebalance itself. For every imbalance in a marketplace, there eventually is an answer or a response, a counter that starts to attempt to rebalance the scale. For years, the media was controlled by gatekeepers in Hollywood or New York, and then the internet was created, and those gatekeepers lost a significant amount of power in media. And now, the scales of power with the social media platforms are starting to create another imbalance. But nature eventually creates a response, a force to rebalance the system. And it's all in cycles. Now, when we talk about the cannabis industry, we see an imbalance of corporate control flooding into a new industry and potentially washing away much of the rich cannabis culture that is there. But whether we call it fate or the universe working its wonders, there have been people, groups, and ideas that have formed to counter that influx of corporate cannabis. Now, there's more nuance and complexity to the situation than just completely vilifying corporate cannabis, but inherently with nature, there is a counter, a response, and an answer to this. What if I told you one of those counters to corporate cannabis was a small town way up in Colorado? So high, it's actually in the highest alpine desert in the world. What if I told you this small town was saved by cannabis and then actually built out for cannabis? Folks, the implications of this story could be massive. It could set a model for cannabis cultivation around the world. The only way for legacy growers, social equity growers, and small craft growers are going to be able to compete with massive corporate grows when it comes to scale is if they stay united. If they create a legitimate collective embracing the cliche but very true saying, united we stand, divided we fall. This is the story of two unlikely partners, a community and the creation of Colorado's largest social equity focused cannabis business park. Welcome. To Area 420, a town built for cannabis. And welcome to High Design. My name is LMC. Please make sure to hit the like button, share, and comment down below. This one could change everything. Not one of us are going to make it five, ten years from now where this industry is going. Our only chance as the mom and pop underdogs is to form like Voltron and compete with these big corporate, you know, money guys. Area 420 could be the largest cannabis business park in North America, and maybe the entire world. Okay, so there's some pretty insane, no actually there are many insane aspects to the story. Especially when we talk about the laws in this small town called Moffitt, where Area 420 is located. But before we get to that, we need to start at the very beginning, where it all started. More so, who started. Meet Michael or Mike Biggio, and Whitney Justice, two people that formed an unlikely partnership of friendship and entrepreneurial excellence. All I was thinking is I just want to find a fucking place where they're not going to, you know, like even the area where I grew up, the, the cops are just insane. They're just patrolling. So I just wanted to get out in the fucking middle of nowhere and be left the fuck alone. That was just my initial thought. I met Mike Biggio about four years ago in Moffitt. I was out here on a reconnaissance trip to see what was going on. I'd heard rumors that there was a lot of growth in the green sector, and I wanted to come and see it for myself. That's when I started talking to Mike, and he started telling me about some of his history of flipping properties in the San Luis Valley, and I thought, he knows a lot about uh, the business, and he seems pretty darn smart. And I just, honestly, I just lucked out meeting him. He also told me right off the bat that he'd been in jail for eight years uh, as a convicted felon. While Mike is obviously an extremely intelligent guy, he was dealt a bad hand of cards early on in life and getting pulled into the juvenile detention system. The cycle of going in and out of jail was prevalent in Mike's life. And this cycle that so many Americans have fallen victim to was in some places to this day perpetuated by the illegality of cannabis. Cannabis really was what Mike loved most, but also it's what kept him in this vicious cycle of incarceration as a teen. When Mike was 20 years old, in the year 2000, he was growing and selling cannabis illegally across Denver. He had 30 people working for him and his operation was moving over 100 pounds of kush a week. He had an almost a monopoly over the traditional market 
at the time because the DEA had disrupted the inflow of cannabis from Mexico. And Mike was really the only one in the area that was supplied from folks up north in Vancouver, BC, rather than down south in Mexico. One of my guys that was working for me, he got in a car wreck, he was on some painkillers or some shit. He had a gun, a couple pounds of weed, and like a pound of mushrooms in the car, and fucking rolled on me. Later that year, he would be arrested in one of his grows and sentenced to eight years in jail for selling a plant that is now legal today. Get out in 2008, fucking goddamn it, weed's illegal, fucking there's dispensaries going, so my sister had applied for a job at a dispensary and with the now friend, and she was offered another job, so she just kind of slid me in there. Okay, but this is when the stores were really then starting to crack off. Back then, there was like very few dispensaries, and so it was kind of like, you know, caregiver to patient, or the people that did have dispensaries that started opening up more dispensaries, they always had a need for product. So then you could go in there with the backpack, you know, and few chicks from California coming in with 20 pounds on their back. I was coming in and dropping everything off, you know, and then it's like you meet all the all the people in the waiting room that are like, oh, you're the, you're the guy. It's like, yeah, I'm not even trying to meet all these people. Like, I don't want you guys knowing who I am. Wild, wild west. Yeah, like it was, yeah power of it man like I saw people come in and like you know cry the emotion of like and fuck I was feeling it too you know I'm here I am fucking doing exactly what the fuck these assholes put me in prison for is like it was a bizarro world I actually tried buying this property that this sits on back in 2016 and starting some other license build outs and we had picked up a property here in Moffat and that's where my, my grow was this was the first commercial facility uh, that we ran we picked this up in 2016, and I was just running a caregiver grow. So we had we were growing like 70 something plants here, and we had just built this greenhouse in the yard, and the then mayor pulls up on the property, just losing his shit about how we can't grow commercial cannabis here. You know the town doesn't allow commercial cannabis. I'm like, let's settle down. This isn't commercial. I have all my paperwork, and he told me to take that paperwork and bring it to the town meeting. And I have not missed a town meeting since. When I first came out here, Mike gave me a tour and he showed me the black market grows, the gray market grows, the legal grows, and they were sort of here and there and everywhere and there was no rhyme or reason to any of this. And as a developer, I'm used to having zones, like that's the industrial zone, that's the residential zone. This is, you know, commercial. So it really bothered me that there was no zone for cannabis like okay this is where this is going to happen legal cannabis cultivations they were scattered all over the place it was bothering the residents of the county here they had this peaceful area um, they've been living there for 45 years or maybe two or three generations even and suddenly a cannabis business pops up right next door there should be a place for that there should be a specific place for that and I said, Mike, you know, don't you think that um, this sort of needs to be organized? Moffitt, I, you know, early identified that this, we can make some shit happen here. The, the board at the time did not have their shit together. I mean, it was just barely a fucking town. I asked him, I said, if, if, if we could um, designate an area for legal cannabis grows, do you think it would be successful? Would people come? And he said, of course they'd come, you know, and okay, let's go. I kind of got into the politics with the county before I got into it really hard with the with the town on the cannabis shit. I bet the farm on this, th this whole project. I had just purchased this rather large piece of property, 420 acres, and we attended a county commissioner's <laughs> meeting. At that very meeting, the county, uh, the county commissioners issued a moratorium on all new cannabis licensing. And I just looked over at Mike, I was so upset. I'm like, what do we do now, grow potatoes? It's better just to deal with a direct board of a town. Because there's a lot less red tape inherently just in the way that the, the structure is set up. So I think that's a big key. But this is where Mike's brilliance comes into play. He just looked at me, he goes, no problem. We don't need the county. That's where the, you know, the idea of annexing into the town of Moffat, because at the same time, you know, the, the politics and the local were getting stronger. 
And that was the pivot. He actually said, fuck the county. Let's annex into the town because we were bordering the town. Fate brought the small town of Moffat that had a, a hundred residents at the time with the desperate and worried pair in Whitney and Mike. It is a very unique set of circumstances that made this possible. And it all falls down to the local municipality. So if you can establish, establish that, that relationship with the local municipality, I'm sure it can be done, then this is the way to go about it. Here's a town that doesn't really have any revenue, doesn't have anything to tax, any way to make money. Like this is a business and industry that'll come into your town and will bring some revenue to this town. I had already done an annexation back east. And so I said, oh, annexation, I can do that, that's easy. You're having people that have grown up in this town and been here forever, and you know, some of them were not happy with it, but there was other people that were like, you know what, hey, let's give these guys a chance, because if not, like this town's gonna die. The town needed to be saved, and Whitney and Mike needed to be saved from the county and their potentially failed investment into cannabis. The town of Moffat went from $27 in the general fund to more than seven figures today. And that, my friends, is from cannabis. Cannabis saved this small town, and hopefully we will be able to see similar outcomes like this happen with small towns around the country. But let's get into what makes this town uniquely suited for cannabis and the build out of Area 420. Because trust me, this town and region of Colorado is pretty unique. I mean, the town has room for a lot of growth. You know, this, this town was actually once proposed to be the capital of Colorado. This was, could have been Denver. And it was, you know, it was mapped out for that. At one time, I think this town had a couple thousand people living here. So the town's birthday is 420. It was founded on 1911, four, yeah, April 20th of 1911. All the wells are 420 feet deep. We just happened to get 420 acres. So we're like, all right, it's Area 420. Our initial idea was just to chop these up into 40 acre parcels, which 40 acres is too, wait, you don't even, nobody needs 40 acres really. Um, but that was like our low ambition, like, okay, let's just do this, it's easy. And then as we progressed, I said, you know what, why don't we just carve them up smaller and make them more affordable for people. So like everybody can do this. Most of the guys out here have one acre lots. Some guys went up to five. I mean, the premise of this is cutting the barriers, the insane barriers to entry in this industry. And, you know, with the support of the town and the lack of building codes, you know, that's we've, we made that possible out here. So this is, you know, we specialize in the guys that don't have the millions of dollars it takes to get in in other states or hell, even in Colorado at this point. Uh, they say, if you build it, they will come. But So we built a place for legal cannabis growers to come where they can have a community, camaraderie. Um, they can congregate, they can feel safe and, and uh, like they, they, you know, they're, they're home here. They're, this is their home. Yeah, this guy's cool, he's a metal worker. So he hand built all these greenhouses. He just invented a new way of running the light depth the coolest shit I've ever seen. He's going through a patent process right now. That's the whole community part, man. Everybody has their own different take on it. Everybody's researching different shit. Everybody has their own niche. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we, we have our grower meetings every month and we get together and chop it up and, you know, share knowledge. But these are dual zone, so you're allowed to live on site and most guys do. So you'll see the rule is the guys will either build their living situation on their property and set their fence back, or some people will wrap it and then you'll just have to separate it like these guys do with separate fenced area. But most guys live on site as well, which is another plus because every time a new person comes out here and, and sets up and lives on site, they're a new voting member of the public. So we're just making our team stronger. You know, some of the people on the town board were supportive of it. You know, they kind of were like, you know, hey, what's what's there to lose? You know, these guys are going to come and put money. They want to come put money into Moffitt. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and seeing to where this has grown now and the potential for the next couple of years is it's like, this is an opportunity to where now you can shape the town and 
yeah, we're going to pay a lot of tax to the town, but we also have a voice to where that tax money gets spent and how that best gets used to build the town. Yeah. Gaining control of the municipality meant staying on top of the town council meetings and attending all of them. As Area 420 started to grow in population and more and more of the seats on the town city council it started to be individuals from Area 420. Because the town of Moffitt is such a small town that are primarily made up of people in cannabis, the regulations that are set in the town creates a friendly environment for cannabis cultivators. Like I said earlier, the town of Moffitt before Area 420 arrived was in kind of a mess. The town had less than $100 in the bank and people in town were getting close to having to move away. When this industry first started and I was working at the dispensary and they, you know, they changed the laws and I had to go, back then it was the felons were never gonna get in. Then I believe it went to like a 10 year deal and you know now a three year deal and now the state is caught up and actually has their own social equity program. So I've kind of been following this, you know, on the state level from the beginning when they were talking about it. I went to the first social equity uh, working group session that the Med had put on in Denver. This was just before COVID. And I, mean, I was blown away at the things that they were talking about. It seemed like they were starting to really get it. Mike's passion is the social equity program. Because Mike served time in jail, he understands what that means. And the interesting part about the social equity program is that the Marijuana Enforcement Division, the Colorado Med, um, has actually put together a plan that sort of links in with his plan. So it's sort of all coming together at the same time. You know, it still comes down to where do you get the license? How do you get the money? You know, it's not enough. So on our end, we, we started our own program. We, we're doing half of the amount that we normally ask of people down on the properties. Um, and we work with them on the financing. Donated a couple lots to two really deserving guys, one Adam Dunn and his whole crew, and then the, the Cornbread Mafia. This is when I first came out here, I tried to explain it to people and I said, you know, it's a little bit like my favorite movie, which was Road Warrior when I was a kid. I go, it's like that city in Road Warrior where they just made it out of like oh, whatever they could find, you know what I mean? And I feel like the grows are a little bit like that. Everybody like is trying to do the same thing, but they're doing it their own way. Like one guy's shaking this way, one guy's rolling them, one guy's tumbling, one guy's shooting water on them. You know, everybody's trying something else and we're all just trying to grow cannabis, but how we're gonna do it is up to the people. And so like, for instance, greenhouse growing is obviously gonna be your best year round, most efficient, but it's your highest input because you're gonna put in all this money to do a quality, because you got a lot of wind out here and a lot of, it's a, it's, it's, it's a raw place, but there's so much potential. So this is our phase two. So we have 160 acres on the uh, east side and then another 160 acres on the west side. We're focusing on our phase two right now our well is up to the north here, and we're building a big extraction facility over here. And then we've sold a number of lots on phase two so far. I think we sold like 12, 13 lots. My plan for the future with our phase two and phase three is to take the same flavor that we have with phase one in terms of you know working with, with the underdogs and, and, and the mom and pops, but elevating them to the next level. You know, this industry is going to another level and as awesome as phase one has been, there's a lot of struggle and that, that these guys have had to go through to, to bootstrap a, a business like this. And again, seeing where this industry is going, I see a tsunami of money coming our way, industry-wise. And I want to be able to set these guys up with a proper infrastructure and, and opportunity you know, the best opportunity that, that we can have. So that's what we're working on in phase two. And I think it's just more of this, what we've done, but on a higher level going forward. Now, the potential implications of Area 420 long-term could be massive. Like I said earlier, this is most likely the largest cannabis business park in the U.S. And we know for a fact that almost 50% of all cultivation licenses in the state of Colorado are stationed in Area 420. Now there is an economic theory I've been studying constantly while doing the story, and that theory is called cluster theory. As you would assume, the cluster theory is the potential benefits that companies can create through clustering together in certain regions. From the basic shit like getting a fence, 
to all the compliance support to, you know, I write that where I think this is really going to evolve into is a distribution network, you know, that we can all lean on. So we're not just swapping the market, you know, that gives us the opportunity to specialize possibly in one, two strains. You know, we don't have to grow a hundred different varieties to become relevant because we'll have the variety within the community. Napa Valley kind of operates like this. You know, it's a collection of independently owned, you know, wine grape growers that, you know, share in the distribution and they chose, I think it's the Bordeaux or whatever variety it is that they grow, but that's 80% of what they grow. 20%, they're always trying out new things and they've all invested to get together in a research development facility that they're all able to access to keep themselves relevant. Many economists have observed Napa Valley to determine the competitive advantage it has. Those advantages being had through entrepreneurship, global technology transfer, and social capital. And I think Area 420 is starting to showcase a collective or cluster of entrepreneurs that are constantly solving problems and innovating. And they're also helping their neighbors with cultivation practices. Once the reputation for cultivating high quality cannabis is established, we can see the multiplier effect of more tourists, new entrants, and knowledge depth and diffusion taking place. And to cap it all off, given the town of Moffitt is now for the most part an entire town built for cannabis. The regulations and cannabis friendly environment is truly unlike anywhere else in the United States. So we can see how Area 420 serves as a collective or cluster where legacy, social equity, and other small cannabis cultivators can come together to thrive on a national and international level. Even with the massive influx of corporate cannabis flooding into the US market every day. Now, cluster theory can produce so many benefits for the companies in it, but one of those tends to be attracting outside investment from infrastructural type companies. And in the case of Area 420, which is constantly growing in size every month, there's actually an energy company that is looking to invest into this flourishing town. Eric led me to the, this power company that we're working with now. We are a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. We're in uh, consider us energy developers or an energy service company. Uh, we also invest in different type of um, startup technologies. Our main focus is on renewable and sustainable energy. Initially, they were just gonna provide power for us, cogeneration, natural gas, solar, you know, get us off the grid. And then after they, they, their whole team came out and they saw the project, we gave them the whole tour. They were, they were awesome, they were really impressed. And they pulled me aside and they said, Mike, we think we have financing for this. Would you be interested in? I'm like, yeah, man, I'd, you know, I don't wanna have to keep selling these lots. I'd rather take this in a better direction. Any kind of cannabis operation, especially indoors, greenhouse or, or like full dark rooms, they use an enormous amount of power. Um, if you were to compare it to, to other more known industries, you could compare it to data centers, cold storage facilities, industrial manufacturing, um, even, even with the use of you know, more efficient, um, energy efficient LED lighting, the, the, the power that's gonna be coming out is something like what's happening here at Area 420 is the, you know, it's, it's, it's on par with the size of a city. Well, first they came to me and said, well, what if we build some of these out? So I put some together. So I'm like, all right. So I put together a, a 10 acre deal you know, we started calling on all the big greenhouse companies. You know, it was gonna be what I thought was a pretty big deal. It was 40, $50 million, you know, each of these operations would be four or five million a piece. It's an opportunity to, to do something the most efficient way possible, right? When, when most, there's a large industrial complex, you just, you just set in with the utility because it's convenient. Um, the unfortunate fact of the matter out here is that the utility is difficult to work with. It's so remote. Any, anything, getting anything done from, from a large company like that is going to take, you know, years potentially. So we have an opportunity to come in, do it right, build it sustainable, build it as efficient as possible, and really custom design it to what these growers need. Um, something that's worth mentioning is we provide the capital for these power projects. We provide the capital for, capital for the infrastructure, and it's, it's paid out essentially the same way that your power bill would be paid out, right? We, 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 we build it out usually over a 15 to 20 year agreement and you just get a power bill. And they contacted me and said, what, all right, we got investors that are willing to put up $500 million into the operations and another 200 million into the cogeneration power. I'm like, holy shit, all right, well that, 
You know, back what? to the drawing. Exactly. So that's basically, I mean, they're talking about funding, like building a total intentional grow complex power off grid, you know, city. city from the ground up design. And the beautiful thing about it is this thing is so massive that the economy of scale really helps it. And so we're actually able to sit down with Mike and Whitney and, and everybody else out here, the entire team, and, and plan out the inside of the greenhouse. And, and rather than just, you know, pick things that are the most convenient or what's available, we can actually design this, custom design it, to be the best possible solution. I, I don't want to use the term cookie cutter, but a more uh, uniform SOP for across the entire, you know, say 100 or 200 different, different plots that are out here. And so by doing that, I mean, we can lower every cost, right? We can lower the, the cost to get the facility up and running, um, the cost of, of building and planning out the power, because that's a big part of it is planning this out. It's easy to say we want to build a massive microgrid, but you have to really fine tune that and, and know exactly what you're building for. Um, and at the end of the day, what we're able to do that as well is, is as a byproduct, we're actually able to lower the cost of, of entry. We're able to sort of open the, um, open the field of who can actually get in and be a part of this. Area 420 represents a place of freedom, a safe space for the people that were once locked up for a plant. While working in this cannabis industry, I have started to become a believer in nature's ability to rebalance the system. Corporate greed has overrun our country. Corporate greed has overrun our politics. And corporate greed will overrun cannabis and its rich culture. But like I said, I'm an optimistic person that believes nature can create a force to rebalance it all. And that force to rebalance the cannabis industry could very well be Area 420. United we stand, divided we fall. Thank you for watching. This is LMC, signing out.